there is an um, interesting phrase by the late Prime Minister of Great Britain, Margaret Thatcher. She once said in the early 1980s, there is no such thing as society. Uh, by focusing notably on market and market forces. However, we have seen over the past years, and we see it currently once again, to which extent can society uh, put itself on its shoes and put everything upside down, including market forces. And that we have seen in the Arab Spring, that we see in other places, uh, and it would be interesting to have uh, an, an assessment from our distinguished speakers um, to, to share with us as their insights. And I think this meeting today is, is the more timely given that uh, one of those neighborhood issues, namely the war in Syria, is also top on the agenda of the G8 meeting. Uh, so whatever might come out of our discussion today, well, let's, let's have a look tonight to what extent uh, that could uh, cause some congruences with the debates in Northern Ireland. Minister Abdelaziz, Tafadal, Ahna Wazahlan Fibiana, Marazania, you have the floor, sir. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, let me start by uh, expressing my deepest gratitude to the colleagues in uh, OSE for providing this opportunity to me to come and participate in this uh, August gathering. Uh, at the same time, uh, my participation today uh, is uh, special because uh, today I'm submitting formally the request of Libya to be uh, a partner in cooperation with the OSCE, convinced that the OSCE has a really an essential role to play as far as security and development and the rule of law is concerned. Ladies and gentlemen, I think the topic of today is a timely one. And I congratulate the colleagues for ICE for choosing this topic. It is extremely important at this stage that we gather and give some thought to what's going on in our region. And as Karen put it, I'll confine myself particularly to the area of the Mediterranean and have some general comments, hoping that uh, your comments will be an added value to the comments I'm going to make and the colleagues that are going to make. Let me start by saying that the security issue should be seen in a different dimensions. The security issue should be seen in its bilateral issue. It should be seen in its regional dimension. It should be seen in its global dimension. We cannot say that the security and living country in this particular region should be seen in isolation from the rest of the neighboring countries. At the same time, we cannot assume that the security situation in a sub-region, and particularly in our area, is seen in isolation from the security situation in the whole region. At the same time, the security situation in our region should not also be seen in isolation from the global security situation. And therefore, the conclusion of this assumption is that security is indivisible, and therefore it, be, it should be seen as such. At the same time, the security issue should not be seen in its classical concept, which is the so-called repressive approach as far as security is concerned. It should be seen in a wider context. And very pleased that uh, the, uh, the, the security issue that is being advanced as a human security for the last 10 years within the United Nations is gaining momentum. It's not just simple to say that uh, through the repressive approach we can ensure the security in our region. We have to focus about uh, democratic institution. We have to focus about health. We have to focus about education. We have to focus about human rights. We have to focus about freedoms. We have to see all this in context, which I call it the integrated approach to security. And therefore, let's move a little bit away from the classical concept of seeing security to move more and the, to the integrated approach of security. However, assessing the security in our region we have to have some kind of mapping of the situation where we stand at the moment. First, we have the Israeli-Arab conflict. The peace of process, as you know, is characterized by a lack of progress. Unfortunately, to date, in spite of all the effort at the bilateral level or at the regional level, the peace process continued to be in a stalemate situation. And I would like to refer to the letter that was sent by prominent personalities within the European Union to Ms. Ashton, indicating to her that do something in terms of 
being engaged as far as the peace process is concerned before it is, it is too late. What is really seen as far as the conflict in Syria is concerned, which is now we are seeing that the countries are preparing for Geneva too. Permit me to say that the way I see Geneva too is like an empty shell that has no substance at the moment. Unless that shell is filled by proper sub substance, politically speaking, by engaging all the parts concerned, I do not see a hope that Geneva too will really achieve the objective that's supposed to be achieved. One note I would like to make in relation to Syria. Have you noticed it? that volunteers from European countries, from North America, that are going to Syria as volunteers, some of them are less than 18 years old. I think this phenomenon should be addressed and should be studied carefully, because those volunteers, either in the, in the, in the sense of solidarity from the human point of view or as a result of the religious orientation, I think this phenomenon should be really studied carefully as far as the security situation as our region is concerned. Now, the third point that I would like to make in relation to the Arab Spring. The countries of the Arab Spring at the moment, they are really witnessing serious problems. And if we say it very frankly and transparently, the situation differs from one country to the other, and we cannot compare the situation in Egypt with that of Libya or Tunisia or Yemen. Each country, while it is characteristics. And what we see at the moment is issues that are emerging which have direct impact on the security situation in the neighboring OSD countries. I would say, for example, arms tra uh, trafficking, drug trafficking, illegal migration, uh, smuggling of, of uh, human beings, not to speak of the fact that this type of sm illegal smuggling is in the increase and organized, transnational organized crime is becoming even more active, particularly in North Africa and the Sahar region. Not to speak of the fact that the vulnerability of the borders, if I take uh, Libya as an example, we have about 4,000 kilometers of land borders, and we do have about 2,000 kilometers of sea borders. To what extent that the Libyan government, as a transitional government at the moment, is capable of securing its border security if there is no vigorous support and assistance from the countries that are concerned, either neighboring countries or countries in the north or the Mediterranean. The situation in the Sahel and Sahara is another issue in the context of the mapping of the problems that we have at the moment. As you know, as a result of the revolution in Libya, and the mercenaries and the weapons that have been smuggled during the revolution to neighboring countries. Though the problem of Mali existed in the 60s, it's not a new one, but perhaps the environment was ready or conducive to this type of uh, movement in the north of Mali. We were of the view from the beginning that when the French interventions in the, in the Mali has taken place, and we thought that probably the right response in such a surgical operation that should not go that long, now, we are talking about the post-conflict in Mali. The post-conflict in Mali and what the United Nations is doing at the moment in terms of peacekeeping operation. We are of the view that it's inadequate to have a peacekeeping operation in the post-conflict situation without having a United Nations mission support to provide support to the Mali government to rebuild its military, to rebuild its interior, to rebuild its democratic institutions, to have free and fair elections, in order to be able not only to assist Mali itself, but also to help the neighboring countries which are investing a lot as far as security in Mali is concerned, not to speak of Algeria, for example, which is playing a key role in as far as the situation in Mali is concerned. From my point of view, the situation of the security as far as OSCE neighborhood, in fact, requires vigorous regional approach complemented by bilateral and global efforts. What I'm trying to say is there are a number of issues that has to be tackled. First of all, there is an obligation, there is a duty. It's not favoritism, it's not a charity. That the countries north of the Sudan, together with other countries, they should really provide support materially or logistically or in terms of capacity building to those countries who are undergoing the democratic process. Without that, that particular support, rest assured, those governments do not have really the capacity as possible to transform themselves from the revolution to building the state of the rule of the government. I would re-emphasize again, it is a duty. It's not just a charity that should be given to us. Particularly
day when we say that security is indivisible. At the regional level, what is needed, in fact, is a so-called regional preventive strategy as far as security is concerned. What we have at the moment is a piecemeal approach to security in the area. It is inadequate to say that a given sub-region is doing its own strategy. What we need is, is a preventive security strategy at the regional level that combine all the efforts together. Focus on operational cooperation, intelligence information sharing and security analysis, devising practical measures to deal with radicalism nationally and regionally. And fourth, what kind of contribution that OSCE could do? I trust that the OSCE, if it takes an initiative and the mandate is given by member state OSCE, I think they can greatly contribute to devising this type of a strategy. By way of example, if OSCE can organize this type of a regional uh, conference, security conference, what is extremely important to exactly address those who are the policy makers and those institutions that are dealing with security issues. Classically, ministries of interior meet together, defense meet together, intelligence meet together. What we'd like to see is these three players in terms of expertise and in terms of policy makers that meet together as defense, interior, intelligence, and to divide this type of defense security strategy that could be viable, that could be translated into action in order to be able that we respond in terms of security to emerging and uh, future challenges. My conclusion is, in the absence of security, there won't be any investment, either internally or externally. There won't be any democratic transitions that move smoothly. There won't be any human rights and fundamental freedoms protection in the absence of security. At the same time, the aspiration for building the state of the rule of law will be greatly jeopardized. And these facts have to be borne in mind in order to address the so-called the preventive approach prior to reacting on an adverse basis. And my last point is, in the absence of a communication strategy to build the support that the public at large should be engaged in cooperating with the formal instructions as far as security is concerned, also, it will be very difficult. And my last point is, please pay attention to the so-called extremism. In North Africa, and we say it very bluntly, that if extremism and radicalism are not controlled at the moment, rest assured that the process of moving from the revolution to democratic institutions is, remains to be a dream. And therefore, anything that can help to you know, deal at various levels, media level, uh, security cooperation, to somehow you know, encounter this type of radicalism, I can tell you that the situation will be far, far, far difficult. With these few comments, I would like uh, Karen to conclude, and we'll be more than happy to listen to any comments that you may wish to, to make or questions that I may be able to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Abdulaziz, for your sharing with us the insight and for the appeal and I think there is some very solid food for thought for the follow-up of tomorrow and hopefully within a foreseeable time limit we will see that what you have just shared with us in terms of action can really be implemented. I, I do hope so. Um, I may now give the floor to um, Ambassador Tachan Idem. Um, Sir, you are also a participating state, plus you have uh, all the uh, uh, experience of being exposed to various wars and conflicts that we have right now in the area. Um, please um, tell us more how you see this. Well, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, the challenges uh, stemming from security uh, developments in the OSC neighborhood have uh, a direct impact on uh, uh, o the OSC region and uh, we have time and again in different uh, documents uh, have uh, uh, expressed uh, the need uh, to uh, pay uh, an attention to the developments in our neighborhood. Uh, 
I can uh, 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 cite uh, many documents about that, uh, and uh, we see that the uh, transnational threats that we are talking about uh, are uh, something that uh, uh, we should uh, work all together uh, to deal with them uh, properly. Uh, in so far as uh, my country is concerned, a participating state of the OSC, uh, we are next to a neighborhood where uh, uh, enormous uh, transformation uh, is uh, taking place. Uh, for uh, the Arab Spring, uh, I remember uh, at Vilnius ministerial meeting, our ministers had uh, the first time a good chance to discuss uh, how we can increase our interaction with our partners in cooperation. And we decided to increase the dialogue, uh, to strengthen our practical cooperation, to have a, a very uh, fulfilling uh, political dialogue, uh, to see the de developments uh, from the eyes of our partners, and also, if possible, to uh, include in our midst uh, new additions to our family. And we, I'm gratified to hear uh, His Excellency, the Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs of Libya, uh, to express their uh, readiness and willingness uh, to join uh, the uh, OSC as a partner for cooperation. Uh, it will strengthen our uh, capacity to better understand uh, how things are moving in this important region. Uh, we cannot uh, confine uh, the uh, challenges and threats that we are talking about to the OSC area and be indifferent uh, to the developments in our neighborhood. And unfortunately, from time to time, we neglect uh, the importance of uh, the developments taking place. Take, for instance, Syria. Syria is going through a very difficult moment. And in the OSC, we hardly discuss uh, Syria. And I'm uh, very appreciative of uh, uh, the Secretary General's initiative uh, to put uh, in our uh, agenda uh, in the security days uh, to reflect uh, about how things are moving there. Because it is dramatic what we are seeing. Uh, it is uh, a, a brutal way to go against the aspirations of uh, the people of the country. And there are uh, enormous potential, as uh, uh, the minister has alluded to, uh, we have also to, to, to be incognizant of the delicate nature of circumstances in which extremists can hijack the developments, and we should be vigilant uh, about it. Uh, there is a humanitarian suffering going on, and uh, uh, my country is uh, shouldering the burden uh, together with some other neighboring countries. Uh, right now, the number of refugees that are in uh, Turkey uh, amounts to close to 500,000. It's a big figure. And uh, we have been uh, uh, making every effort to accommodate them, to shelter them with the services required. It's is something that international community should pay more attention. We are uh, hopeful that uh, the Geneva uh, two uh, talks can perhaps produce some progress. And uh, the only thing we have to uh, caution is that it shouldn't be an exercise to legitimize the efforts of the existing regime in Syria. Because uh, there is a growing danger with the use of ballistic missile, even uh, chemical weapons against the people of Syria. And uh, the uh, territorial integrity, sovereignty of uh, Syria should be preserved. And uh, it shouldn't be uh, a transition uh, by which one ethnicity or religion uh, should have the uh, prominence in governing of the country. Uh, now, a uh, few, few words on uh, uh, Afghanistan, because it is also uh, uh, an important uh, issue that we have to pay attention. Uh, Afghanistan uh, is approaching to a critical 
uh, year, 2014. But we shouldn't see 2014 to be an exit year. International community should continue uh, its strong commitment for the security and stability of Afghanistan. Uh, we have to see 2014 for the transformation of uh, responsibilities from ISAF to uh, Afghan uh, National Security Forces. And international community should uh, uh, try to have a strategic vision to deal with the challenges emanating from Afghanistan. For OSCE, we are one of the actors uh, when it comes to uh, efforts uh, geared towards bringing a difference for the better in Afghanistan. So we need to cooperate with other international actors and to see what the OSC can bring as a cutting edge comparative advantage to our efforts. And I think uh, uh, when we look uh, to the transnational threats and uh, it may be in terms of fight against terrorism, border management, uh, counter narcotics, uh, OSC has a capacity to bring forward. Uh, we, we need to uh, streamline the project that we have in hand, and we are talking about second generation projects, and we have to focus on those which can bring a qualitative change in terms of what we are doing as an organization. Now, for the uh, engagement with our partners in co uh, for cooperation, uh, sometimes uh, my colleagues on the permanent council can share the view as if there is a lack of interest on the par part of our partners in engaging with us. Uh, my uh, message is always uh, the same. Right now, those countries are going through an important transformation and they have certain priorities. And I fully agree with the minister that not each country is the same with another. So one size cannot fit to, to all. And we need to engage with them properly, always in respect, uh, respectful of their priorities. It should be a demand-driven process. And we have to be patient. Uh, while being patient, uh, it doesn't mean that we should be uh, rather idle. We have to create awareness. We have to raise awareness about what OSC can provide. And uh, in doing so, uh, it would be essential uh, to uh, expose our uh, toolbox to those uh, countries uh, and uh, for them to utilize them uh, in uh, close cooperation uh, with the OSC. The word assistance is something I'm against. It should be a cooperation on equal footing, and we have to be respectful to their expectations. Regional cooperation is very important for uh, Mediterranean Basin countries, but also in terms of the situation in Afghanistan. And for Afghanistan, there is now an initiative called Heart of Asia, and uh, it is the ownership of the regional countries and engagement of all. And I think it is essential that what uh, OSC uh, could do is to support this regional is initiative. Uh, most of the countries in the region are participating states of the OSC, and Afghanistan is our partner. Therefore, the projects uh, that we uh, should focus on uh, would be uh, with a view to strengthening this regional uh, uh, cooperation and Afghanistan's ownership. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Ildem. Uh, we have the pleasure to have the representative of another important international organization, namely the Arab League, with us. And um, how to uh, bring together organizations, interagency cooperation, it's often a topic uh, when discussing more efficiency. Um, the English word, French word orientation, most probably it stems from Orient. So often, we in the West have been looking to the East, what might happen next? Uh, so maybe what is
going on right now in that part of the world. And um, Minister Abdelaziz has warned us by putting the finger on extremism, on volunteers coming from Europe uh, to the other side of the Mediterranean. Maybe Ambassador, you can share with us your insight in this orientation to, to shape our view. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Karen, this morning, I must say I was, uh, 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 I found it quite interesting that two ideas were put forward repeatedly by, by the speakers. One related to uh, comprehensive and integrated security, which is something that people thought was necessary within the Euro-Atlantic community, so to speak. Uh, not much has been said how this can be applied to our part of the world. This is something that we have been talking about in, amongst ourselves in the region for a very, very long period of time, but unfortunately has not materialized and has not been supported, in our view, enough by uh, those who have interests in the region. Uh, the other issue is the transnational threats, as the ambassador uh, referred to today, this afternoon, but also uh, Dr. Schussel this morning spoke about these very important threats, terrorism, migration, energy security. These are very important issues, important to the OSC area, but they're all very much affected by what is happening in the uh, Middle East. And we can go into detail about each and every one of them, but I think these, these are very important things. But having made this uh, preliminary remarks, I, I think I, what I would like to do is to highlight that there are really four challenges that we face in our part of the world. Uh, challenges that have implications for the security of the OSC area. Uh, two of which have been with us for a long time. Uh, the first, of course, is, uh, you can refer to it as the Arab-Israeli conflict. Others like to refer to it as the ongoing peace process. I mean, th these are issues that can be debated, but it's not, the definitions are not important, but I think the essence is what, what's important. The other issue that has been with us for some time is also Iran. Since 2003, 10 years, so it's been around for a decade. The other two issues, challenges, uh, that are more recent, uh, one, of course, is Syria that you have referred to, which is very topical. It's being discussed today in the G8. It will be discussed uh, bilaterally between the United States and, and Russia. And it is an issue that is extremely important, and I will get down to that in more detail. The second issue that is fairly recent is the Arab Spring. Uh, again, we can I'll talk to, talk about it in a little bit more detail. Now, the interesting thing is that all four, of course, like everything else in the Middle East, are closely linked, positively and negatively. And all four, at this particular point, are coming to a very critical stage. Either there is a positive outcome or a very negative outcome. I'll come back to that later. So that's, it's very important that efforts are deployed very soon, as the minister said. We cannot wait much longer because all four are moving to a critical stage, whether it is Syria, whether it is the peace process, whether it is Iran, and whether it is, of course, the Arab Spring. Now, let me start very quickly about the Arab-Israeli conflict. I think the main challenge there is the f what appears to be the fading prospects of a two-state solution. This is extremely serious because the implications uh, will be long-term instability in the region, more radicalism and so forth. What you see today in the region, unfortunately, is Israel building walls, bo both physically and mentally, and isolating itself from the region, and that is extremely dangerous. Uh, the settlement policy continues with its obvious implications, so the horizon of hope for the Palestinians is being shattered, and that will breed radicalism. 
But there's always a silver lining, and I'll come to the silver lining of all of these things later. Uh, Iran. Iran has been with us for 10 years as a security issue in the Middle East. I've had the opportunity to deal with this issue for the past 10 years here in Vienna in a different capacity, and I've followed it all through. It's a history of lost opportunities, unfortunately. Mistakes have been committed by both sides. Just a few weeks ago, I had an interesting conversation with an American, former uh, American official at a very high level, and I, he conceded, as others have in the past, that mistakes were made. Between 2003 and 2005, there could have been a way out. And at that point of time, the United States was not keen on participating actively in the negotiations. Today we have a new president in Iran, Rouhani, who was the chief negotiator at that period of time. There's been a lot of water under the bridge since then. A lot of things have changed. The region has changed. But maybe this is also a silver lining. Maybe there will be an opportunity to re-engage once again. Uh, of course, Iran has been a complicated issue. There has been a fair level of discomfort on the part of many countries concerning Iranian policies. But also, Iran is an important country and has to be part of the solution. It is, for whether it's Afghanistan, whether it's Syria, whether it is security, it's particularly the uh, nuclear issue, all of these are issues that you cannot ignore in Iran find a way to make Iran contribute positively rather than playing a different kind. Uh, Syria. Well, uh, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, I can tell you that if the world suffered from Afghanistan for years, and we have seen what has happened in Iraq, whether for the Iraqi people or for the contiguous area, I can assure you Syria, if not addressed sooner rather than later, will be even worse than Afghanistan and Iraq. And that we can discuss in more detail. The configuration around Syria is different from Iraq, it's different from Afghanistan. Foreign interven military intervention, which happened in the previous two cases, didn't add very much, if not even contemplated in the case of Syria. That's maybe the silver lining. So we need to work very quickly on Syria. I th if, I, if you look at the situation in Syria, I think it's, it's almost like three cogwheels. At the higher level, you have the United States and Russia. At the middle level, you have the region. And at the lower level, you have the Syrian players. And I think the challenge for all of us is to find a way to synchronize what is essential is for the United States and Russia to come to some sort of agreement. Unfortunately, the agreement doesn't relate only to this part of the world. But the sooner the better. And I think what's important here is that maybe we were waiting when it comes to Iran and Syria. Uh, maybe again, sound positive note, maybe we're wa waiting for two elections. We're waiting for the American election so that the American and Russian can start discussing seriously, and maybe we're waiting for the Iranian election. So let's hope that serious business is conducted at this point of time. We cannot wait much longer. Uh, that brings me to the Arab Spring. Again, is it a misnomer? People say it's not a spring, it's not, it's not, it's not a revolutionary situation. Be it as it may, uh, I can speak about the spring in my country, Egypt. Spring is usually a time of unstable weather, sandstorms. So unlike Europe, it's not the best time of the year. And 
It is followed usually by a very warm summer, stifling heat. And then you have a very soothing autumn and winter. So spring is different from our perspective than it is from European perspective. So I'm not entirely pessimistic as many would. I think it's also important if we're talking about geography to talk about history. And here I would like to put what is happening in what is referred to as the Arab Spring as the second wave of the emancipation of the Arab people. The first wave happened in the 20th century when there was a struggle for to rid ourselves from foreign influence in whatever form, it, whether it was occupation and had different kinds of government and so forth, but it was basically to get rid of foreign domination. What you see today is the second, and this wave is the Arab people are struggling against despotic forms of government. Each country like the minister said is different. Each country will deal with it in a different way. Each country will react in a different way. But this is a wave that is with us and will stay and will take some time, hopefully not as long as the, the Germans or the French or the Italians took. That was a different, different centuries. Now we have technology revolution, communications revolution, so I don't think it's going to take that long. But I think at the end of the day, the democratic transformation will now, Egypt is critical. We can discuss it in detail, but I would not want to do that at this point. But I think, what are the yardsticks by which we would me measure a successful democratic transition or transformation? I think two issues need to be discussed, need to be addressed, and they have to be addressed in a democratic, open, and transparent way. One is the role of the military, and second is the role of religion. Both have to be addressed. And they are being addressed, again, in different countries in different ways, but specific, specifically in Egypt. Already the role of the military, I think, some quite an important progress has already taken place. The role of religion is much more complicated because in Egypt, religion and army are very special in different society. Both have a nationalistic element, and the military beyond that is related somehow to modernization. So it's, it's somewhat different in our part of it. So these two issues have to be addressed in an effective and open and democratic fashion before we are able to say that there is a successful now, what, if you look at the situation today, I think there are two ways of looking at it. It's like a glass half full, half empty. Uh, there were those who would tell you it's moving in, in, a, in a very negative direction. There will be further instability, and the light is not at the end of the time. I, I look at it differently, I will give you the most positive scenario, and for three reasons, I'm very, very quick. One is, now we have these two elections, the U.S. and the Iranian, let's see if these will produce any results. They won't happen very soon, but I think we have to capitalize on it. Second, the issues of role of religion and army are already being addressed. So it's not something that's are being addressed right now. And let's see what happens, I would say, in the next year or so, how these things are going to be addressed. But more importantly, and I think that is critical, is that it is the youth who have been responsible for initiating the second wave of emancipation. And they are here to stay. And their point of reference is entirely different from all former generations. They know how the world operates. They understand what human rights are not going to give up the struggle for freedom. 
that is why I'm optimistic. How long it will take? I hope sooner rather than later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ranzi, for being optimist <laughs> and for giving us good reasons to be optimist. Um, I think there are two good points that I would like to keep also for the floor for the debate following uh, addressing religion and addressing the role of the army. This is also a topic that uh, concerns right now a number of participating states inside the OEC. What should be the role? What kind of separation uh, between politics, state, and religion? It's a topic that concerns not only the Arab countries, it's a topic that concerns also OEC participating states. So I think that there could be definitely some interesting food for thought for that. So thank you for having brought up that theme. And the use, the Arab use, that does not anymore say it's maktub. It's written in the book of history. We can't do anything about it, but that are acting. And um, from the Mediterranean, I would now like to move to the other heartland. <laughs> According to McKinnon, the father of all geopolitics, uh, Central Asia, the heartland, where things happen first and then the others uh, are affected. Mr. Dan Evans, you are an insider. You have spent uh, important years in Afghanistan. Uh, could you please give us your ideas for what the OEC can, could, or should not do? Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. <coughs> um, let me uh, let me say first uh, that I'm of course very happy to be here in the old Hofburg spent many a year in this very hall, uh, but I'm even more pleased now that I'm part of this panel. I'm very, very impressed, I must say, by the previous speakers, because some of these comments are absolutely highly pertinent, and the kind of talk that we uh, have to hear, and some of the advice given. So what I think I should do is maybe add a bit of a perspective from, uh, from the ground. I'm, I'm a practitioner conflict, uh, in the sense that I've unfortunately always ended up in a situation where there was either a conflict to be prevented, or to be uh, protracted, or to be uh, resolved. Now, uh, with that in mind, let me make a few points, uh, building on what I've heard this morning and just now. First of all, let's be very clear, uh, conflict resolution is not done by organizations. It's done by nations. It is a matter, we heard it this morning, it's a truism, but it needs reminding. It is a matter of political will. And political will is, of course, the expression of national interest. So if there is a conflict, and we see outsiders rushing in to help, to bring peace, to bring stability, be wary. Think what's in it for them. What, who is losing? Who is winning here? What is the national interest? Without recognizing the national interest involved, you don't solve any situation. So that's one. That means also, by definition, that an international organization, whether OSC or UN or others, have a, a limited role. They can only as far as the owners of the organization permit. I think the Secretary General mentioned the other day, yeah, it's like the horse, and not make a drink, you can bring it to the water. So, international organizations, yes, there's a role. They can hopefully clarify issues. They can plant some seeds maybe here and there. They can do some nudging, as we heard this morning. I th find that a very useful uh, concept. They can implement once agreements are made. But that political will issue looms very, very large. Whether we talk about frozen conflicts, protracted conflicts, whether we talk about Afghanistan, Syria, or what have you. Now, going now to a practical situation of Afghanistan, here is, were it not so tragic, it would be a beautiful example, a school example, of an international effort gone awry. I often call it a noble mission that went astray for, uh, for rather obvious reasons and reasons that could have been avoided. 
the Afghan intervention, however positively it was received initially and widely acclaimed, I think, it has badly suffered from a few flaws that should not be repeated. One obvious one is that it has not given space for multilateral uh, prerogatives. It has reduced the multilateral role to a minimum uh, in favor of bilateral responses, if not unilateral responses, uh, partly. So here's a situation that has been highly uh, bilateralized and, because of the nature of the participants, highly westernized. That combination of bilateral and Western is fatal for an intervention far away from the West in the traditional sense. And the credibility of the intervention has obviously suffered as a result. I had a horrendous problem going around in Afghanistan, and I went truly around in a good overseeing fashion to the villages, but trying to convince Afghan villagers that I was not an alien invader trying to take away their uh, religion or going after their natural resources or having other hidden agendas. That was a tremendous task. It took at least an hour in the well-known Afghan type of gatherings to get the minimum of trust for them to listen. So having this bilateralized, westernized intervention from outside was, was, a, was bound not, not to fail, I wouldn't call it a failure, but bound to have very limited success. And there are at least three features there, phenomena, that I found striking. Uh, one, of course, is the very weak participation of Muslim states, if I may call it like that. I found that amazing. And I've been discussing this with uh, representatives of such states. I say, here we are, basically trying to address the problem of Islam extremism, Taliban. Why are Western NGOs, Western armies involved in this? This is very much your business. Why don't you move in? Why isn't the IOC coming in and at least, at least giving support to this intervention? At least give a strong moral support if there was no moral, no financial or military support possible. But they abstained. They stood on side. There were some individual countries that joined, as, as you probably know. But any authoritative international Muslim organization was not there to speak out in favor of what was necessary. That was a, a very serious weakness and that should have been prevented from the start. So he was a, a, a great tactical error, uh, ab initio. The other one, which I found is now very pertinent, is the question of ownership. Western interventionists, however well-intentioned, are in a hurry. They want to have quick results. They want to have the troops out. They, they, have, they have a clock, they have a watch. The people there have the time. So this hurried process and procedure doesn't work well because it usually makes the actors ignore the slower moving local masses. And so there is a tendency to preempt, to do things by ourselves rather than letting those who the whole process affects take charge. So this ownership question in solving conflicts is very, very important. And it, it plays up right now. I, I, I'm making probably a not very uh, pretty comment. But if you want a peaceful solution, in Afghanistan, and there is no military solution. Everyone is agreeable to that. So we need a peaceful solution. We need negotiations. Then you need to dialogue with the enemy, in quotation marks. 
the enemy is not a monolithic, amorphous uh, group, evil group. This is a highly, highly diverse uh, group with lots of elements who are quite moderate, who want to have an improvement of uh, social economic conditions, who would like to see an end to corruption, who wouldn't like to see the devastating impact of the drug trade. There are all sorts of elements also among the Taliban. Declaring Taliban as not a respectable partner or putting conditions to them for participating in negotiations that are unacceptable. Like, for instance, you cannot even question the constitution that we have imposed in Afghanistan. That is impossible. Then you don't bring the process forward. So uh, here is another feature of an intervention, namely insufficient recognition of who is owning the place. That makes the the conflict uh, intractable. Because Taliban is at least enjoys one third of the Pashtun uh, support. Pashtun is by, la by far the largest uh, community uh, ethnic group in, uh, in, um, in Afghanistan. So ignoring them, dem uh, demonizing them collectively, that doesn't help. That doesn't bring peace together. And peace has to be negotiated. So here I come to an uh, Another point, uh, the flaws that I mentioned with regard to Afghanistan lead me to a recommendation that there has to be an enhancement of multilateralism against unilateralism, obviously, and bilateralism, in, in, and particularly at the regional level. And he, so, if rightly so, the uh, Libyan minister, he says, to have international support. I agree with that. But if that is highly bilateralized, with all the conditions and preconditions and hidden motives, then you may not be helped all that much. So the more we can multilateralize this international support effort, the better it is. So, but then particularly also at the regional level, because I'm convinced that partners in a region understand each other better, know each other better and can come up with better solutions than those from far away and outside. And this brings me to OSCE because OSCE is a regional response to a regional conflict. Now this is then almost automatically the recipe for elsewhere. Maybe there has to be more OSCEs in other regions. I don't see OSCE moving there and do all sorts of things. But let OSCE be helpful, to the extent possible, to create similar regional organizations that can help to bring about more cross-border trust, cooperation, dialogue, what have you. I think it was mentioned earlier this morning in the, in the, the, in the discussion. Let OSCE be some kind of a model, not to be adopted uh, uh, lock, stock, and barrel, but there are features in OSCE that are really pertinent and to the point also for other regions. I remember in our chairmanship of the Dutch in 2003, we had an exchange with ASEAN. They were fascinated in Southeast Asia about these instruments, these tools that the OSCE has, particularly the High Commission for National Minorities. Great institution. Oh dear, great institution. That whole third dimension, very, very interesting. Now, you can't export it all on a mass, but some of these ideas can be can be transferred. And OEC could technically help in bringing this, these regional structures to uh, to more uh, fruition and, and, and foster the dialogue. So there, I think OEC as a model has a very important role to play, a passive role, if you wish. Uh, actively, I see that as a derivative in the sense that uh, OSCE could quite directly uh, help support regional uh, cooperative ventures like in Central Asia, like they do on the border management, police training, which could be sort of jointly done in, within regions is another area of known expertise. I know from my early days in Kosovo how our police training became an example for, uh, for Preshava 
for Italy, for uh, Macedonia, we have, um, so there are OCE experiences from our glorious past, because the past has been glorious, that are uh, useful to uh, emulate. So I uh, probably took more than uh, you wanted to allot me, but uh, don't go for mission creep. Uh, we don't need that. But there is useful work to be done. recommendation. I think it has been taken note of also for tomorrow's deliberations. The floor is now with uh, Deputy Director Mrs. Karatayeva who will speak in Russian and I'm pretty sure since uh, Central Asia is also uh, not only of interest when it comes to religious matters etc as, as Mr. Evans has just pointed out but also resources, natural resources, commodities. Uh, so uh, that's also most probably part of certain interests. So we're looking forward to your uh, Уважаемые коллеги, я хотела бы вам предложить взглянуть на тематику нашей сессии в контексте или через призму вопроса, насколько ОБСЕ готова к вызовам и угрозам, исходящим из-за периметра организации. На мой взгляд, ответ на этот ключевой во многом вопрос является и воодушевляющим одномоментно, и настораживающим. С одной стороны, очевидно, что причины и э, проявления современных вызовов и угроз э, носят комплексный характер и не могут быть оценены исключительно в рамках одного измерения, будь то военно-политическое, экономическое или социальное. И в этой связи э, ОБСЕ – это именно та организация, которая способна сформировать адекватное видение и предложить адекватные э, механизмы э, урегулирования возникающих проблем, в том числе и в превентивном порядке. Но в то же время необходимо признать, что разделение государствами и участниками ОБСЕ единых ценностей еще не влечет за собой унификацию национальных интересов. И в результате мы имеем с вами разнящееся восприятие и оценку одной и той же ситуации, порой диаметрально противоположной оценки. Ярким примером тому являются события на Ближнем Востоке или ситуация в Сирии в частности. Как бы много мы ни говорили о проблемах, которые исходят из стран или регионов, с территории стран или регионов, соседствующих с государственными членами ОБСЕ, следует признать, что соседство у каждого свое. И, соответственно, и степень приоритетности, а также акценты будут разниться в отношении каждого отдельного государства или региона в целом. Какие проблемы, может быть, видятся из Центральной Азии? Наиболее часто артикулируемыми проблемами является непредсказуемость ситуации в Афганистане в контексте вывода коалиционных войск из страны. Кроме того, это проблемы, связанные с нерешенностью проблемы в отношении ядерного досье Ирана. Проблемы, связанные с арабской весной и возможными последствиями для стран Центральной Азии. Кроме того, следует учитывать не угрозы, но риски, которые несут государства Центральной Азии в связи с активным ростом присутствия Китая в регионе. Я сконцентрирую свое внимание на Афганистане, и в данном контексте можно выделить две проблемы. Первая проблема – это сохранение Афганистана в качестве основной базы по производству опия сердца и трафика наркотических средств в Россию и страны Европы транзитом через Центральную Азию. В принципе, прогресса здесь никакого не наблюдается. По данным за прошлый год, мы наблюдаем 20-процентный прирост пассивных опиумных в отношении 2011 года. Известно, что и здесь подходы к механизмам урегулирования или противодействия наркотрафику серьезным образом разнятся. 
Хотя очевидно, что сконцентрировать свои э, усилия необходимо по, в рамках трех направлений. Первое направление – это усилия по переориентации афганского аграрного сектора на производство иных сельскохозяйственных культур. Второе направление – это жесткое противодействие поставкам прекурсоров на территорию Афганистана. И, наконец, третье и немаловажное – это борьба с собственными рынками потребления наркотиков. Потому что, мне кажется, такой подход, как демонизация Афганистана и возложение всей ответственности за наркотрафик непосредственно на эту страну, не является э, правильным. Э, ну, к примеру, соотношение прибыли от наркотрафика э, является 1 к 69%. Только одна часть из получаемой прибыли остается на территории страны. Второй проблемой, увязанной с Афганистаном, является использование территории страны для подготовки, может быть, немногочисленных, но действительно террористических группировок, в состав которых входят представители этносов, проживающих на Северном Кавказе Российской Федерации, в Синдзяно-Гурском автономном округе КНР, а также стран Центральной Азии. Деятельность этих этно террористических этноподразделений несет прямую угрозу конституционным строям стран Центральной Азии. Несмотря на то, что общая численность боевиков не превышает порядка двух тысяч человек, противодействовать им на территории непосредственно Афганистана страны Центральной Азии, естественно, не имеют возможности. Остается надеяться, что их внешнюю активность будут пресекать национальные силы безопасности Афганистана, собственно, вооруженные силы стран региона, а также механизмы, предусмотренные в рамках ОДКБ. Но мне кажется, что нам действительно необходим эффективный диалог между такими организациями, как ОБСЕ, НАТО, ОДКБ и ШОС. Пока что получается не очень хорошо, но, может быть, используя аналогии сегодня уже приведенные, ОБСЕ будет той организацией, которая приведет всех на водопой или, по крайней мере, инициирует встречу этого водопоя для этих организаций. Такое количество сил безопасности, направленных на противодействие немногочисленным, террористическим группировкам только на первый взгляд кажется излишним или более чем достаточным. Здесь следует учитывать и такой фактор, как заявленное лидерами Аль-Каиды изменение стратегии международного терроризма. Суть реформы заключается в том, что постепенно будет сокращаться финансирование подготовки террористов в специализированных лагерях и последующая их заброска на территорию объекта. Взамен будет развиваться система интернет-подготовки террористического подполья на территории практически любой страны, в которой имеется доступ к интернету. В случае с Центральной Азией ситуация усугубляется еще такими факторами, как негативные последствия финансово-экономического кризиса для материального и социального благополучия граждан стран региона и активный усиливающийся экспорт идеологии религиозно мотивированного радикализма и терроризма на территорию Афганистана. Уважаемые коллеги, вот то, что я сейчас озвучила, это лишь малая толика проблем, с которые формируются за пределами нашей организации и которые э, испытывает на себе Центральная Азия. Насколько эти проблемы являются злободневными и волнующими для стран э, Юго-Восточной Европы или Южного Кавказа? Я думаю, что ответ на этот вопрос, наверное, должен остаться за представителями этих стран. Но, на мой взгляд, мы не, ну, может быть, мы много знаем друг о друге, но мы не так хорошо понимаем друг друга до сих пор. В этом контексте я хотела бы отметить своевременность, целесообразность идеи, инициированной господином Заньером, 
относительно создания э, сети академических институтов ОБСЕ. Полагаю также, что уже назрела необходимость создания специализированного института ОБСЕ по изучению проблем Центральной Азии, которое предложило бы нам не совокупность различных оценок ситуации в регионе, а консолидированную, основанную на единых индикаторах оценку ситуации в регионе и ее картографирование, если хотите. Мне кажется, что усиление научной и, что немаловажно, аналитико-прогностической составляющей организации – это тот необходимый элемент, который будет способствовать улучшению понимания проблем, которые испытывают партнеры по ОБСЕ, и формированию действительно единой и неделимой безопасности на всем пространстве организации, включая евроатлантической и евразийскую территорию. Спасибо большое за внимание. Uh, given uh, enlightened us uh, a lot about uh, your vision and your perception of the threats in, in your area. Very interesting uh, elements uh, shared with us also about how future training or current training is already happening when it comes to radicalization. Uh, I'm confident that uh, you are now ready for questions, comments, critics. I see the ambassador of uh, Tunisia to take the floor. And then the gentleman in the back, Ambassador of Egypt. So maybe I start with Ambassador of Tunisia to be followed by Ambassador of Egypt, and then we move the mic back. Thank you. Please, thank so you, you have Mr. to go. Well. And uh, of course, I would like to thank all the uh, eminent speakers for their uh, exhaustive presentation and also the call for the end of uh, a wait and see situation in order to ensure adequate and uh, larger support to democratic transition. Uh, we welcome, of course, His Excellency, Mr. Mohammed, uh, Mohammed Abdelaziz, Foreign Minister of Libya, a country with which we share it and continue to share actually so many things beside our borders and the social, economic, cultural uh, levels. Uh, we are also uh, facing almost the same challenges. Uh, democratic transitions, restoration of security, social peace, fight against extremism and terrorism. And uh, I am convinced uh, that the contribution of His Excellency Mr. Abdelaziz today was very enlightening about the huge challenges we are facing, the co-responsibility, and uh, I would say the, the duty, as he actually called it, the duty uh, toward peace and security the concerned uh, country in the region. Uh, security, of course, is our common uh, concern because security is indivisible, of course, but is closely linked to stability in the neighboring region. And uh, the contribution of Libya in this regard uh, within the OSCE is important, and my country, of course, support, fully support its candidature as a, a Mediterranean partner and looking forward for its involvement. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Karen. Uh, allow me a few, a few remarks from very interesting presentations that, uh, that we've had uh, today. In, in no particular or specific uh, order, but I would like to, to start with one phrase that was mentioned by uh, Mr. Dan Everts, uh, when he said, when you see foreigners uh, rushing in, beware. That's quite an interesting phrase. My question to you, you think that applies to Syria? Uh, and you've had some questions with regard to Afghanistan and why what you labeled as Islamic NGOs or organizations or whatever were not uh, active there. I'm not so sure that this is actually the case, but also it's good always not to take things out of the 
context in which they happen. So Afghanistan is a history, is a very long history, is actually a protracted history as the Greek uh, minister was referring to this morning by saying that, you know, diplomats have this uh, way of coining phrases. I'm not sure if it's diplomats or politicians actually who do that. But anyway, <clears throat> that's with regard to uh, what, what you uh, referred to. One very important uh, element that uh, was mentioned, and I do welcome uh, His Excellency, the Foreign Minister of, uh, of Libya, whom we have worked and engaged extensively in, in the past few years. Uh, I agree fully with, uh, with what you said on the need for uh, more cooperation um, and some concrete action, uh, in specific between our states in, 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 in North Africa. And I think that is already in place because we do have the mechanism of uh, cooperation between the three states, Tunisia, uh, Libya, and, and Egypt, uh, on uh, common issues uh, relating to our uh, Arab Spring. Uh, so that, that I think, is, is, a good, uh, is a good way to, to go about it. And with regard to how the OSCE fits in into that. Uh, you know, taking maybe the phrase that was uh, coined by, by uh, Mr. Everts, definitely there could be a role for, uh, for the OSCE, but we have to be careful in, in, in how we engage in, in that. And here I'll tie it in with what uh, uh, the ambassador of Turkey has, has mentioned that, you know, there sometimes appear to be a lack of interest on the part of, of partners to engage. Uh, maybe a, a certain element in that is lack of dialogue, a lack of sufficient dialogue. And this is something that I've stated repeatedly in the meetings of the organization here, that we do not necessarily have that ample dialogue in order to understand each other, to understand what are the needs? What do we want? Both sides, not only one side. So that element of dialogue is, is important. My only word of caution here, with the proliferation of worldwide initiatives on anything and everything, my own personal view on this is that it's always better to start on a practical, uh, project-oriented step. And this is something that actually has an impact. People can feel that. There can be results out of such an, an, an effort. And therefore, I think that we have already done uh, quite a good deal of cooperation in, in North Africa. And I still think that you know, we can do a bit even more in that, uh, in that regard, whether with the OSC or in terms of transnational threats, etc. We have also the UN ODC in which we, uh, we cooperate in various, uh, in various issues. Uh, the, initiative by the Secretary General, the network of think tanks. Brilliant idea, I agree with you fully. Uh, and maybe that would be one of the elements that would solve this problem that we don't have enough dialogue. Maybe that is what is needed to, to do the trick for us to be able to uh, have an in-depth, extensive dialogue that can take us really to reach uh, uh, certain conclusions uh, at the end of the day. Uh, the definition of spring, Ambassador Ramsey referred to, uh, maybe I might differ with that definition of, of spring uh, coming from the delta and not from, from the desert. Uh, just to say one thing, uh, spring by its nature is a period of very high activity as compared to the hibernation of winter. And this is precisely what is taking place in Egypt. No time in the recent history of Egypt has it been a time of uh, such political activism. And this, I think, is one of the main accomplishments of the uh, Arab Spring in, in Egypt. But as I said, it's a period of labor. And so labor is still uh, continuing in that regard. But definitely, uh, we're looking forward to reaping the rewards of that labor and spring. Thank you. Actually, I don't have any questions, but I have some few comments. 
um, Chunar Aldin, the Executive Director of SICA, Conference on Interaction and Confidence Building Measures in Asia. During today's discussions, I think two concepts were underlined, indivisible security and comprehensive security. When we take under consideration these two concepts, it is obvious that there is an immediate neighborhood between the region of SICA and the region of the OECE. The region of SICA, my organization, covers the 90% of the population and area of Asia, not only in Central Asia, but also in the Caucasus, in the Middle East, South Asia, and Southeast Asia. And in this region, we have both conventional and unconventional uh, threats and challenges. Some flashpoints in South Asia, Southeast Asia, and especially in the Middle East and Afghanistan, uh, which, we t which we could regard as conventional threats. And also there are some unconventional threats and challenges uh, like terrorism, the uh, human trafficking, drug trafficking, etc. So in the organization which I represent, we are dealing all these challenges and threats. And while doing that, we have in close collaboration and cooperation with the OECE. SICA from now on also is very much willing to have a, to make a bridge between Asia and the OECE. So I would like to say that uh, the audience. Thank you. Sir, at the ambassador of Algeria. Ambassador of Algeria. Just a uh, few words to, just to say that uh, <coughs> I have been heartened by the speech made by His Excellency, the, the Minister, Foreign Minister of Libya. You know, he said clearly what are the challenges in Libya, but also in Tunisia and uh, to some extent in the whole region. They are, the challenges is to establish a working democracy, to establish the rule of law, to, to make it that uh, basic human rights are respected, are also part of the rule of law, to make transparency a rule, but the uh, dangers are very high. You don't have only uh, Islamic radicalism. You have pure terrorism. We don't know what, what, are the, what is the ideology of some terrorists. You have narco-traffic. Narco traffic now, it's not only in the west of Africa. It is, it is growing. It is, uh, it is going to, to east. And all these forces are against the progress the transition regime wants to make, the transition people. And these transition powers are weak. As he said, they need help and they need help now. When we had a meeting with our partner FOIC in Rome a year ago, it is exactly what I was saying. I was saying if you want to do something with the countries that have known their, uh, their spring, you have to do it now. And you don't have to do it through nitty-gritty of two or three uh, cooperation small moves. I mean, USC within its regional responsibility because security is indivisible, should move strongly to meet the needs of countries like Libya, which is formulating it very clearly. This is all what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Let me uh, make a quick comment. 
And thank you, Mr. Ambassador of Tunisia, for the support of Tunisia as far as the uh, partnership with the OSCE is concerned. And thank other uh, brothers, the other ambassador, who, for their kind words as far as the Libya situation is concerned. I think if I may just make a quick comments. <clears throat> I think Ambassador Ramsey, in his expose, I think he gave us a sense of optimism as far as the Arab Spring is concerned. And I always say that we as Arabs, moving from the state of the revolution to building the state of the rule of and viable governments, we make our own destiny, but we cannot make it alone because in the context of the globalization, transnational crime, international terrorism, various types of illegal trafficking is interlinked. And no country in this world can claim that they can really <coughs> ensure their internal peace and security alone. And therefore, as I mentioned to you earlier, it is the duty of all countries to come together to support any spot where insecurity is prevailing. And this is, I'm happy that um, Mr. Ambassador Fargiri has highlighted this point again. Uh, I think Ambassador Takan uh, made a very good message that we should not talk about assistance and support. We should talk about cooperation. And this is the difference, in my point of view, is between the, the partnership in terms of interest and the so-called solidarity partnership. As far as security is concerned, I call it the solidarity partnership that should prevail in order to encounter any element that is in front of ensuring internal security and peace. I think Dan, I like very much his, uh, his comment when he mentioned the sense of ownership when it comes to solving internal conflicts. Outsiders should enable such a dialogue, facilitate such a dialogue. And with the final analysis, the country concerned that should really focus on its own problems through dialogue. And I can mention to you, you may recall that when the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Libya and the Ministry of Justice were sieged by so-called revolutionaries and who were unable to access to our ministries. And there are two schools. One school said the state should be forceful and should really clean up those people in order to be able to continue our work. The other school is saying, no, no, box and dialogue. And at the end, the dialogue which really prevailed in order to solve that problem. I think uh, Lysia said something which is extremely important in relation to prioritization when it comes to security situation, given the fact that each country has its own specificity and its circumstances. But when she spoke about Afghanistan, and having worked in relation to the problem of Afghanistan for the last, I would say, eight years, when I was in the international civil service, I was saying the same thing when I was a regional about Afghanistan every year, nothing changed. It's the same production, it's the same policy of the international community. Now my question is, to what extent did this policy of helping farmers by replacing the cultivation of opium through agriculture? But my question is, given the fact scientifically is opium is used in the medical field, what prevents the international community to buy the opium from these farmers and invest it in the medical field? And yet, the farmers can be supplemented as far as the economic income is concerned. Uh, this, is a, this is a thought that is being uh, discussed. But honestly, the international community should move a little bit faster because we cannot say Afghanistan is the country that is highest in terms of cultivation of opium. And each year, the ONODC produces a global report on drugs. And yet, the situation continues the same. So I would go back again about uh, my colleague political will of countries in order to be able to translate their action into concrete reality. My last point, if you permit me, Karen, is um, there is a number of statements about uh, foreign interventions and foreigners coming in with some talk. I would like to say there is a difference between engagement and between imposition. What we are talking about is that our bilateral regional, international partners, when they come to help us, we don't see it that imposing their views. We see it as engagement. And therefore, if, for example, in Libya, when the Security Council resolution was implemented, 
in order to protect the civilians. We did not, we, we did not feel offended because some others are claiming this is for intervention. Had it been the case that the NATO has not intervened, I can assure you that the regime would have finished up 70% of the population for the sake of maintaining that position. And therefore, sometimes interventions where it is legitimized internationally to help a cause, it is, should be really permitted. And until today, we are grateful for what NATO has done because we know exactly the consequence of that. And therefore, it is good to keep in mind the difference between engagement and opposition. And uh, the last point I would like uh, uh, to mention is that, uh, yes, uh, we are very happy uh, about what's going on. Uh, we know that we're facing serious problems as far as security is concerned. But if there is so-called partnership solidarity that is translated into concrete actions among all the countries concerned, I think the building of the democratic institution could be affected. Not to speak of the fact that in the absence of a humane, functional, and criminal justice system in any country of our own Arab Spring, we cannot talk about protection of the democratic institution. And therefore, the support in terms of capacity building, specialized training to build our judges, prosecutors, our law enforcement, our to humanize the treatment of, of, of our inmates in prisons, I think we are going in that direction. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, Mr. Ambassador uh, Sidam, uh, dialogue with Well, uh, 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 I will come to that, but if you permit me, I have a few points to uh, capture. Uh, first, uh, uh, to react to what uh, my distinguished Egyptian colleague has said, I fully agree with uh, him that our uh, dialogue uh, with partners should uh, be strengthened. Uh, the decision in Vilnius that ministers uh, have taken provides us the good basis. And I must uh, say that in two years' time that I served in uh, Vienna, I can see a better engagement with our partners. And it should be structured, focused, and uh, seeing the practical cooperation aspect of it. As to the uh, intervention versus engagement, I fully subscribe to the views of uh, the minister. Uh, right now, uh, in Syria, yes, Ambassador Ramsey uh, has told us that we shouldn't create yet uh, another uh, situation like Iraq or Afghanistan and the uh, uh, repercussions would be even more serious than those. Uh, and uh, we should uh, be vigilant and uh, be engaged. Uh, it is uh, not uh, uh, proper for international community to sit idle watching things when uh, Per day, uh, we may see 200 uh, people being killed. Uh, uh, we need to join forces to attend to uh, this uh, business. There is a humanitarian suffering. Uh, we are talking about a country of 6.8 million. Uh, 4 million of them uh, displaced. 1.6 million uh, in neighboring countries. And I can see the point uh, raised by uh, Minister uh, Bakoyani in the morning. She said that uh, uh, there will be a growing migration problem. But right now, this problem is being absorbed by neighboring countries only. And what we want to see is the engagement of the international community to alleviate uh, the burden shouldered uh, by Turkey and Jordan itself. We are spending one point uh, uh, five uh, billion dollars and it is uh, not a negligible amount and we would like to see international community to give uh, uh, its attention and share. Uh, with regard to uh, Afghanistan, uh, I uh, uh, want to repeat uh, my message that regional uh, cooperation and Afghani ownership is essential uh, and uh, I fully agree that uh, as Evers has said, uh, ownership uh, in terms of reconciliation is essential. Uh, reconciliation is uh, fundamental to the resolution of uh, problems that exist in Afghanistan, and we should be helpful. Very last uh, comment. It is uh, related to 
whether OSC can provide a model uh, for our partners in terms of regional cooperation. I think uh, it can and it does. Uh, when you look uh, to Heart of Asia uh, initiative, which is gaining prominence, we see a number of confidence building measures which have been put in place, very much uh, resembling what we have within the OSC community. When we look at the uh, code of conduct uh, on political military aspects of security, which was translated to Arabic, uh, and it was a good initiative, it can inspire our partners also to come up with regional uh, initiatives to strengthen their cooperation. As to demonstrations, uh, demonstrations are part of a democratic society to uh, provide uh, uh, individuals to express their opinion, dissenting view, and this is actually what uh, uh, it has been uh, in my country in the recent uh, days. Uh, the uh, demonstrations started with the environmentally sensitive citizens to express their uh, opinion on Gezi Park, and it started with a sit-in uh, in that park. But uh, my uh, colleagues from uh, Western Europe will agree with me that uh, sometimes uh, innocently started uh, demonstrations can easily be hijacked by some uh, extreme uh, fringe uh, factions to uh, uh, put their uh, uh, voice uh, in a rather uh, violent manner. And uh, there is a difficult task to be undertaken to make a distinction uh, between uh, uh, peaceful demonstrations and those who are trying to benefit out of this. Uh, you may uh, perhaps raise whether the police intervention uh, was exceeding the limits. Uh, initially, yes, it did. And in fact, uh, uh, you may recall that uh, the uh, government leaders uh, had expressed their apologies uh, for the excessive use of force. And uh, there was a dialogue initiated with the representative of the demonstrators. So, we have to take uh, put things in the, their uh, proper context. And uh, I may uh, just uh, remind all of us of the recent uh, demonstrations in various capitals uh, or cities in Europe, be it uh, in Frankfurt, Zurich, uh, Madrid, uh, or uh, uh, in any other uh, Western uh, country. And uh, I think uh, all in all, these demonstrations are a free expression of opinion and part of a democratic society. Thank you very much, sir. I may turn to our host, uh, Secretary General Sanhi. Do we still have time? Do the, are the interpreters still ready? Because I still saw some people wishing to take the floor. How do you judge it? Uh, there's Mr. Evert who wants to take the floor. A lady here. How should we proceed? Mr. Evert. Okay, are the interpreters still ready to stay with us for a while? Thank you. Okay, so I give. Yeah, I'll, I'll be very brief. Um, on the Syria, you asked me very directly, where are the interests? I would be against my own recommendation. If I'm going to tell you, you should tell me. Uh, it's your problem, in a way. Um, so um, let my recipe was, let the region solve its regional problem. Uh, I'm more serious about the, um, the absence of, for lack of a better word, I call Muslim authoritative uh, institutions. Uh, but I was appalled to see the uh, OIC almost adopting a resolution to condemn the international uh, aggression in Afghanistan. That was really out of the Afghans themselves prevented in the very end this, this resolution. But it shows a complete misunderstanding, I think, of what was at stake, and that there was a much more active role to be played by, uh, by what we call that, uh, Muslim countries. Um, but I, I grant that from the onset, the design of the intervention has been lacking in bringing on board uh, 
responsible, interested, involved uh, neighboring uh, areas and countries. Uh, my last point, uh, because I, it cannot be emphasized enough, and I am totally in agreement with the Turkish ambassador here, that we have to reinforce the support to areas suffering from conflict, to, to channel that support through regional, uh, or, if not organization structures, whether it is ad hoc, like your Istanbul uh, formula, regional uh, cooperation for Afghanistan, but, but that is the way to go. And here is a reason for OSCE to be optimistic, because you have a, we have a few tools in the toolbox that are eminently suitable to apply to very difficult situations in the neighborhood. And I mentioned two. High Commissioner for National Minorities. Every neighborhood country has a problem in the area of national minority, whether it's Afghanistan, Syria, uh, Libya, you know better than me. But a building trust between minority is, of course, an, uh, of the essence. Here we have a very interesting OSE tool. The other one is religious tolerance. Religious intolerance may not be the cause of conflict, but it certainly fuels. And I, for one, don't understand why an initiative like a high representative for religious tolerance has not been initiated amongst Arab League, IOC, name it. Because this is a key contributing factor to strife and, and widening conflicts. Why not have such a thing? in other organizations. Thank you, sir. So. Uh, time is running out. I, I just have one comment. The issue, of course, of foreign intervention in different guises, I will very briefly touch upon that. Uh, two kinds. One is the political, which the minister referred to. So it is uh, useful if it is done in the appropriate manner at the right time timing is very important. And military intervention, of course, if it is internationally sanctioned, sometimes may be necessary. But judging from precedence, the history we have seen, uh, when there is a foreign military intervention under whatever guise, the problem has always been the day after. The day after has never been figured, whether it is in Libya or in Iraq and anywhere else. And I think this is if a decision is taken to intervene in whatever form, you have to think of the day after. Otherwise, the people of the country pay a heavy price and the region picks up the pieces. And that is unfair. I just want to flag that and I think it's absolutely essential if ever we come to the point where some sort of intervention, military intervention, is being contemplated. Thank you. Um, thank you to all our panelists. Um, Я буквально пару, <coughs> пару слов. А, то есть а, да, чудесно прошедшая сессия. Мы действительно пришли к пониманию, или там еще раз подтвердили, что а, нет понятия соседства где-то. Да? Информационные технологии создали ситуацию, при которой мы являемся одномоментно соседями всех, и, и вся, и, и, собственно говоря, нет каких-то чужих проблем. Опять-таки, разделяя эти ценности и это понимание, мы сталкиваемся с тем, что нам необходимо научиться вырабатывать какие-то э, общие механизмы. Как только вопрос касается детализации, вот здесь вот начинается расхождение. От этого серьезно пробуксовывает э, раб, работа. Вот, ну вот, к примеру, в частности, сегодня прозвучало предложение, почему бы Афганистану не, не, не оставить свой вектор производства опиума, да, и международное сообщество будет э, закупать. В принципе, это, может быть, как-то краткосрочно э, проблему решит, но э, вопрос, наверное, стоит в том, что сельскохозяйственный кластер вообще как-то надо диверсифицировать и развивать. И при этом, естественно, надо учитывать, что рано или поздно появится обязательно кто-то, кто заплатит больше, чем э, официальные структуры, закупающие для фармаколога фармакологических целей. То есть это не решение проблемы. 
А вот другой вопрос, как, например, сформировать э, хороший спрос и рынок на производство, например, э, шафрана того же или любых других культур. Или мы можем искать иные механизмы, я не знаю, климатические условия имеют значение, но существуют новые технологии э, развития сельского хозяйства в, э, и неблагоприятных климатических условиях. Вот. Ну, собственно говоря, я буду закругляться. Спасибо. Excellent panelists, and uh, I'm very, I think, well, stick applause once again for you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Madam. <laughs> and uh, um, a practical announcement, we will now move location, uh, reception. When you go out of the building, you just had 200 meters turn you to, to your left, uh, to, to the museum, uh, where's the reception, and then the night old session. Many thanks to all the people responsible, also to the interpreters for having facilitated this session. Thank you.